Hey everyone, how's it going? Dr. Spear here again. Good to see you. Um, I'm out here getting ready to talk about our next topic, keeping with the theme of different classes of biological molecules and um, you know understanding their uh, monomers, you know their building blocks, understanding their characteristics, how they're used in living things. And today we are going to talk about proteins. And so let's get to work. Okay, um, so proteins are incredibly important in biology. Now you can't say that one class of molecule is more important than another, but on a mass basis, you know, most things are mostly protein. 50% uh, of the dry mass of most cells is some kind of protein. Proteins do everything. There's all kinds of different functions for proteins, like structural support, storage, transport, cellular communications, movement, uh, uh, antibodies, you know, defense against foreign substances. Bottom line is, um, proteins are very diverse. Also, they're very big. Remember I said that biological molecules tend to be very big molecules, macromolecules. Proteins embody that. Proteins are large. They're diverse, so there's all kinds of different proteins that do all kinds of different things, and they're very important. Um, now, you may be familiar, you may have, have already learned and know a lot about proteins, but uh, again, a theme that I'm going to come back to again and again and again with proteins is their shape is incredibly important, their three-dimensional shape. And so their three-dimensional shape determines how they work. And if you change the shape, you change the function. And so that's going to be something that we're going to come back to again and again and again. So that's the important thing to know about proteins is that shape is critical to their function. And so we said there's lots of different functions for proteins. And so let's just give you examples of those. And we're going to touch on all of these during this semester. Um, a lot of, uh, most of our enzymes are proteins. So enzymes are catalysts. What's a catalyst? A catalyst is uh, a molecule that um, speeds up another reaction without itself being changed. And so biological catalysts are called enzymes and 99% of the time they're proteins. And so the enzymatic proteins in your body help to speed up the chemical reactions that you need to be alive. Okay, so some proteins um, function for energy storage. You remember we said that, you know, plants mostly store their energy as carbohydrates. Animals use carbohydrates for energy storage a little bit. Animals tend to, to store most of their energy as fat, but you can also store energy as proteins. And so a good example are the proteins inside an egg yolk. Um, those proteins are there just to store energy so that the developing embryo has something to eat. Some proteins are used as hormones. And so insulin is a perfect example of this. Uh, insulin is a protein, but it acts like a hormone. So you remember earlier when we talked about steroids, we said that, that many uh, steroids are hormones or many hormones are steroids, right? But proteins can also be hormones. Lots of different types of molecules can act as a hormone. Um, so again, what is a hormone? Hormones are chemical messengers, okay? So they're some type of molecule that's released into the bloodstream, carried all over the body, but they only influence those cells that have a receptor for that hormone. And so it's a way to get a signal all over your body. Um, it's kind of like a broadcast but only certain cells are tuned in to that broadcast. And so that's what a, a hormone is. Um, proteins have other functions like um, contractile and motor proteins, uh, which is a fancy term for muscles, right? And so your muscle is mostly protein and it's the shape of those proteins that allow your muscle to contract. And we're gonna go into detail exactly how do muscles contract later in the semester. Um, you're familiar with antibodies. Antibodies are 
proteins, part of your immune system. We'll talk about immune system later on in the semester. But, um, you know, the antibodies are proteins that are shaped for a particular pathogen. And so if you have some sort of foreign uh, invader in your body, a virus or bacteria or something, these antibodies will bind to that and then that um, triggers your immune system to remove the foreign invader. Uh, in the cell membrane, we have lots and lots of transport proteins. And so we'll talk about the cell membrane in more detail, but um, you've got this membrane that surrounds the cell, but you gotta get stuff into and out of the cell. And the membrane is sort of designed to not let things cross, right? But you still need channels to allow things in or out. Well, most of the time, that's some sort of protein that goes through the membrane. And sometimes those proteins um, can be, you know, they're like gates, they're either open or closed. So they either let stuff in or they don't let stuff in. We have uh, receptor proteins, and we'll talk about these when we talk about the nervous system. And so the nervous system is another way to send signals around your body. You know, hormones um, send signals around the body. Nerves also send signals around the body. And one way that they can transfer the signal is that you have to have these receptor proteins that bind to a neurotransmitter, and that protein changes shape, and that causes a nerve to fire. We'll talk about that in great detail later in the semester. We have structural proteins. Remember we talked about carbohydrates and some carbohydrates like chitin or cellulose are structural. Well, some proteins are also structural. And so here you've got an example of collagen, you know, and these are collagen fibers or a protein that's in your skin that give it structure. Or you've got keratin in your fingernails or your hair, you know, so it's a, it's a tough protein that's used for structure. Okay, so, you know, you, Protein is, you, you you've hear about that in your diet all the time and things like that. Um, which of these foods are high in protein? Chicken breast, donuts, fish, beans, or more than one? Well, the answer is more than one, right? Chicken breasts, that's muscle, right? Muscle's gonna be protein. Fish, again, we should all eat more fish. Fish are very high in protein. They're low in fat, they're low in carbohydrate. Uh, when you eat a fish, mostly you're eating the um, myomeres, which is the type of muscle that runs along the side of the fish. Beans, beans are a great source of protein, very high in protein. Okay, so we talk about proteins. Um, proteins are a type of polypeptide, okay? Um, and so a polypeptide is the polymer and the monomer, the building block of a polypeptide is an amino acid, okay? And so if you have a polypeptide that has a biological function, then we call that a protein, all right? And so um, some proteins are more than one polypeptide. So for some proteins like uh, hemoglobin, you need four separate polypeptides that all interact together, and now you have a functioning protein. And so again, the monomer, the building block of these, is an amino acid, and the polymer is a polypeptide. Why is it called a polypeptide? Whenever you join amino acids together, that's called a peptide bond. And so if you get many amino acids joined together, you have many peptide bonds, or it's a polypeptide. Okay, so based upon what I just told you, true or false, all proteins are polypeptides, but not all polypeptides are proteins. Is that true or is that false? That is true, right? Again, um, you can have a polypeptide that by itself doesn't do anything, but when it teams up with other polypeptides, then it has a biological function and we can call it a protein. Now, having said that, um, we'll probably use the terms interchangeably. Um, you know, I'll slip and sometimes call them polypeptides or sometimes call them protein, you know, so just so you're aware, but they're kind of, they're not exactly the same thing, but we kind of use them interchangeably. Okay, let's talk about those monomers, the amino acids. Um, amino acid is a type of molecule. It's got um, a carboxyl group, 
on one part of it and an amino group and those are the functional groups. Remember we talked about the functional groups, right? These specific small types of, of molecules that are reactive, that where a lot of the chemistry takes place. And so um, every amino acid is going to have a, a, a carboxyl or a carboxylic acid on one side and an amino on the other side. Um, now, there's only 20 of these amino acids. There are lots more amino acids, but in biology, there's only 20. And every per, uh, protein in the world is built out of those 20 amino acids. So it's, it's, it's you know, the analogy is uh, the English alphabet has 26 letters, and you can make any word and any sentence in the world out of those 26 letters. It's the same idea, right? By just arranging these amino acids in a particular order um, and you know, adding more or taking some away, you can build any protein in the world. Any, yeah, any protein in the world. Anyway, um, so here again, we're kind of showing a, a generalized schematic of an amino acid. And you see on the one side, you've got the amino group. Anytime you hear the word amine or amino, think nitrogen, all right? And so if you've got an amine group or an amino group, then it's got to have nitrogen in it. And if you look at this diagram, you see it's got, it's an NH3, you know, ammonia. That's also got nitrogen in it. The other end, you've got the carboxyl group. Uh, sometimes it's called a carboxylic acid, which is why these are called amino acids, right? Again, remember what functional groups are. We, we already seen some of these functional groups. And so these are just two particular functional groups that you're going to find on an amino acid. Now you see attached to them is this side chain, which they call the R group or whatever. And so this is a much bigger part of the molecule. Right now in this diagram, it looks like this R group is just small, but the R group is actually the biggest part of the amino acid. But they all have this amine and carboxyl group on one end. And so here are um, some different amino acids and, and how they, and you can see they've got kind of you know, different shapes here, but if you look at them closely, you see they all have that, that um, nitrogen, that amine group, and they all have the carboxylic acid, the COOH, right? So you can see that on each of these different amino acids, but then hanging off of that, the big part, the R group, there's a lot of variability in those R groups. So here's a diagram showing um, even more, is this all of them? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Yeah, here's all 20 amino acids. And when you take genetics and if you get into cellular biology, biochemistry, you'll get into the chemistry of these in a lot more detail. But what I would like for you to know is that, you know, if you again, if you notice, the gray shaded area of all of these is all identical. Amino group, carboxylic acid, or carboxyl group. But then the the boxes with different colors are the R groups, and there's a lot of variability in those. But again, these are the monomer. These are the building blocks. Let's put these together to build a polypeptide. And remember what I said about proteins. They're incredibly diverse, and we gave all those different things that protein can do, proteins can do, but all of those proteins, all of those in all the organisms in all the world can all be built with just these 20 amino acids. That's pretty cool. But that's also um, one of those pieces of evidence that suggests to us that all living things are related and all living things evolved from the original uh, or, you know, ancestors. And if we take any living things, you know, you and a bacterium and an oak tree and you trace it back far enough, you all have a common ancestor. And, and why do we think that? Because all living things share these 20 amino acids. Okay, and so we said that, you know, a polypeptide that has a biological function, that's what actually we're gonna call a protein. And so we also said that proteins are very dependent upon their shape. And so you take one or more polypeptides and twist them and fold them into their particular shape, then they can function as a protein. And so here's just a diagram showing you a couple of different ways you can draw the shapes of proteins. 
and this is where it's all at these days you know um just biology is growing in leaps and bounds and and one of the um you know big things that people are working on is you know figuring out the shapes of proteins we have identified all these different proteins but you know now we can start to figure out their shape and if you can figure out their shape you can figure out their function and if you have an abnormal protein with a incorrect shape or a different shape you can understand why it doesn't function as well and so understanding the shape of proteins is just you know immensely important and and it's a growth industry so now if we're going to build a protein what we got to do is we got to get a bunch of amino acids we need to connect them together via peptide bonds and then we're going to form a long straight chain of them so this is there's not going to be branches it's not like you're going to take a couple of amino acids and then do a couple here a couple here that's not how it goes it's one long string of amino acids all right and you say well wait a minute you know proteins are all about shape but you're saying every every protein is just a long string it starts out as a long string but then those amino acids interact with each other and will interact with other amino acids that are nearby and you have things like hydrogen bonds and disulfide bonds and things and that chain starts to coil up and twist into its crazy shape and now you have a functioning protein right and so if you've ever seen an old phone cord did you even know that phones used to have cords probably not but you know the twisty up cord right that starts as a long straight thing but when you let it go it coils up and it can coil up in several different ways so that's how we're going to build a protein and so when you look at this long ribbon for example if you zoomed in you'd see that it was a whole bunch of amino acids all holding hands it's just one long string but when they start to get you know next to each other they start to interact with one another they can pull that protein into its crazy shape So how, you know, if shape is so important, then how do we make sure we get the right shape? Well, it's the sequence of amino acids that determines that three-dimensional shape. So those amino acids, you know, there's 20 of them, but they have to be put together in exactly the right order. Again, it's just like making a word out of the 26 letters of the alphabet, right? If you don't put the letters, you can't, you know, spell the E-H-T right it's the, the words the letters have to be in the right order and it's the same thing with a polypeptide the amino acids have to be in the right order and if they're in the right order then they'll give it the right shape um, so if you change a single amino acid if you delete it or replace it with a different one or you move it that can change the shape of the protein and completely change the protein's function it doesn't necessarily it doesn't guarantee it's going to change the shape and it doesn't guarantee it's going to change the, the function but it's very likely just a single amino acid out of place so again talking about shape something that's very important these days with the coronavirus we're talking a lot about vaccines we're talking a lot about antibodies and you know antibodies work because they have a particular shape that interacts perfectly with other proteins on the virus or the bacterium or whatever's invaded your body and if they have a matching shape then the antibody can bind to the surface proteins of that pathogen and then that triggers your immune system to remove that pathogen we'll talk about the immune system in more detail later in the semester okay so when we talk about protein structure we identify four specific layers of protein structure. The primary structure is that sequence of amino acids. So what order the amino acids are in, that's primary structure. Once you have the amino acids together, they start, start to form, they can, they don't have to, but they can form some stereotypical shapes, which are called the secondary structure. The secondary structure, there's only two, a beta pleated sheet, or an alpha helix and so not all proteins have these but some proteins start to form these stereotypical shapes and so they get, you know we've given them a name called secondary structure tertiary structure is that complex three-dimensional shape that is so critical to the proteins function then quaternary structure 
is when you have more than one polypeptide that must come together to make the functional protein. Not all proteins have quaternary structure. Some single polypeptide chains function just fine by, the, by themselves, but some proteins require more than one polypeptide and those must twist together and that is quaternary structure. As we said, it all starts with the primary structure, the sequence of amino acids. And so if you change the primary structure, it's possible that you can cause a change in any of those other st structures. It's not guaranteed, but it's possible. And so again, this is just kind of a, another diagram, just kind of putting this together in your head. If you look, you've got, uh, you know, zoom in and each of these circles is a single amino acid. And if you zoomed in on those amino acids, you could find the amino end and the carbo carboxylic acid and the carboxyl end. And we just put a whole bunch of these together. Again, biological molecules are very long. You get a long string of these things, you're gonna make a polypeptide. Um, and so um, again, primary structure is like the ordering of letters in a, in a long word. I kind of made that analogy already. The primary structure is determined by the DNA. And so your DNA determines what order amino acids are gonna go in that protein. So a little review again, what's the proper order here? This is our mantra that we chant every night before we go to bed. DNA makes RNA makes protein. DNA makes RNA makes protein. Every time you need to relax, just chant to that because that's how it works. And so the DNA makes the protein. First it makes an RNA. The RNA then makes the protein. And if you know, how do you decide what order the amino acids are in? It's based upon what the DNA structure was. Again, we're gonna go into this in a lot more detail. Okay, so secondary structure, we said there's only two of them, right? So that's why you can remember secondary structure, there's only two. An alpha helix, a beta pleated sheet. Sometimes you get these stereotypical shapes. And so um, if you're looking here, you see that the alpha helix is just a, you know, a corkscrew, a beta pleated sheet. You've got, you know, again, imagine this long chain of amino acids and it sort of snakes back next to each other as they start to fold. And so that's what they're showing you here. You've got kind of these, this is all one long chain of amino acids, but if they get together and the right amino acids in the right order, you get this pleating. And so that's a beta pleated sheet. You also notice that they're pointing out the hydrogen bonds, right? We talked about hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are very weak, but when you get a lot of them, they become very strong and they're very important to holding these shapes together. Uh, the tertiary structure, that's just the complicated 3D structure that's so important to a protein. And if you, get, if you need two or more polypeptides to come together and they twist together, that's the quaternary structure. So here's an example. Again, we talked about collagen. Collagen is, has quaternary structure. Um, you, a single polypeptide will not make a collagen fiber. But if you get three of them and they twist themselves together, that becomes a functional structural protein, and that's collagen. Here's um, hemoglobin, um, right, which carries uh, um, oxygen through your blood, and it's a big, important protein. And you see that it's got four polypeptides. You've got two alpha subunits and two beta subunits. So each of those subunits is a single polypeptide, but you need all four of them to twist together in quaternary structure to make a functional hemoglobin molecule. You also notice that, that um, within the structure of this hemoglobin, you've got a heme group and an iron molecule, right? This is why they test iron and why iron is important for your blood. Iron is what they call a cofactor, okay? And we'll talk about these, these will come up again, but a cofactor is some molecule that helps a protein hold its shape. So shape is really important. 
we saw how like hydrogen bonds are important to holding the shape, but sometimes cofactors are important for holding shape. Um, and, and hemoglobin's example, the iron is one of the cofactors, right? You need that iron to help um, bind and pull these polypeptides together to get the right shape. If you're anemic and you don't have enough iron, then your hemoglobin can't hold its shape. If your hemoglobin can't hold its shape, it can't hold its function and you can't carry oxygen through your blood. Okay, so here's another figure that just kind of pulls all these together, showing how the primary structure relates to secondary, relates to tertiary, relates to quaternary structure. Okay, so, you know, we said that the, the primary determinant of the amino acid structure is the DNA, and that's always true. Um, we talked about how, you know, hydrogen bonds and, and cofactors and things can help proteins hold their shape. But, you know, there's lots of things that can influence the shape of a protein. Um, and so things like uh, pH or the salt concentration, the temperature or other environmental factors, those can all have an influence on the shape of protein. We talked about pH. Why do we worry about so much about pH? You know, those hydrogens are very reactive. Um, Hydrogen bonds are very important to shape. And so, you know, if, you've, if you're at the incorrect pH, then your proteins might not be able to hold their shape properly. And if they don't hold their shape properly, they don't function properly, and that's bad for the organism, right? Uh, salts or temperature things. These can all influence the shape of a protein. So this is a big reason why most organisms have a, a tolerable range of, of conditions in their environment. This is what sort of defines the niche for a lot of organisms, right? Like, uh, uh, you know, certain plants can't grow um, at certain temperatures or at certain pHs or certain fish, you know, require um, certain salt levels in that. This is a big reason why, because if you are outside your niche, if your habitat does not have the conditions for which you evolved, then your proteins don't function properly and the organism does not do well and can die. If the protein loses its shape, that's called denaturation. And then if it's able to regain its shape, it's called renaturation. A denatured protein is biologically inactive. And so this is just a fancy way of saying what I said a hundred times already. If a protein changes its shape, it will lose its function. So if a protein is denatured, it doesn't work. And so, like we said, you know, if you denature, you unwind, you lose that critical shape, but then if you renature, you regain the shape. Now, if the proteins, proteins can usually tolerate a little denaturation. So if you're a little bit out of your comfort zone, the protein can snap back to the proper shape. But if you denature it too much, then it will be unable to regain its shape. You can't uncook a steak, right? And so if a cow gets warm, you know, it's muscle proteins might sort of lose their shape, but the cow cools down and they're fine. But if you take a piece of that cow and you throw it on the fire, then it changes its shape and that's a cooked steak. So the last thing we'll talk about is, um, again, there's just some common diseases. There's lots of uh, diseases that are related to malformed proteins. Um, one classic example is a sickle cell disease or sickle cell anemia. And so this is a disease in which the blood vessels, uh, excuse me, the blood cells, red blood cells, um, take on a characteristic sickle shape under certain conditions and they don't carry oxygen as well. And um, they also, because of that sickle shape, they tend to, to uh, aggregate in certain areas. Well, this um, blood disorder is caused by a single amino acid change in the hemoglobin protein. And so you remember we talked about hemoglobin and it's made of four subunits, two alpha subunits and two beta subunits. Each of those subunits is a single polypeptide, so it has quaternary structure. But if you look in a, a non-sickle cell hemoglobin, which is the top here, you can see the order of the amino acids. And in the bottom, you've got a sickle cell hemoglobin, and you see that the number six amino acid changes from a glutamine to a valine, right? 
So it's just a single amino acid change. Now, why does that amino acid change? Because the DNA changed. This is an inherited blood disorder. And so there's a, um, a difference in the DNA, which causes a difference in the amino acids. Changes in DNA do not always cause changes in amino acids, but in this instance it does. So that's a single amino acid in this big, long subunit, and it's only one of two types of subunit. But then that causes that subunit to change its shape. When it changes its shape, the hemoglobin changes its shape. The hemoglobins tend to crystallize and bind to one another, and you get that characteristic shape of the red blood cell. And so that's just an example of how a single amino acid change and a, you know, can change the shape, can change the function. There's lots of other diseases that are uh, associated with this. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, mad cow disease, all of these have to do with misfolded proteins in the neurons of the brain. So understanding that shape, understanding it, how it gets misfolded, is key to understanding how to treat these diseases. Awesome. So that's proteins. We're gonna be talking about proteins all semester. So uh, let me know if you got any questions and I will talk to you later. Have a good one.